pleasure to introduce our speaker, who is my friend, who has been a long time devoted member of this community, who is a, a practitioner, who is a professional Jamaica that lives abroad, but, but our country won't, won't let him go. So he, he says he lives abroad, but he works here. And it's always a pleasure to hear his words of wisdom and inspiration. So I invite you now to put your hands together and welcome Clive Edwards, who will bring our message this morning. Good morning. Good morning, Clive. Thank you, Sandra, for those words of welcome. And I certainly join with her in welcoming you this morning to this wonderful idea in the mind of God, the Sunday morning service. And thank you for sharing your consciousness with us this morning. Um, I noted the interest, and of course, we have to join and welcome our friends in the World Wide Web who have joined us this morning also. I noted the interest. Reverend Ann's comment on the title for the master class. One of my previous professional lives, at least my first professional life as a scientist, and in physics, this formula E equals mc squared, E for energy, m for mass, and c for velocity. velocity. That is, so that, yes, and the velocity of light. So that formula speaks about the quantum of energy, which is a result of the quantity of mass and the speed of light. So it will be very interesting to see, if you all attend the retreat, what you're going to experience from I equals mc squared. It's my pleasure this morning to share with you some ideas from a book that I have been reading. I have many blessings in my life. And one of my blessings is that I have very wonderful friends. And one friend, and she actually is sitting to my right, and don't believe that this has been choreographed, because I was supposed to have spoken last Sunday. I was out of the country, so it's not a matter of knowing that Sandra would have been, would have been supporting me this morning. But there's one mind. Eh? Um, but one of these friends is Sandra, and she, some 11 Christmases ago, gave me a book and she wrote in the cover page that she hoped that with this gift, my intentions would always reflect God nature. And that those intentions would manifest to support, to expand, to express, to enrich, and to bless me abundantly. So I thought this morning I would share with you some of the focal ideas that are contained in this book for your information and for your consideration. Of course, I make no judgment on this publication, except to say this book has inspired me greatly. It certainly would be impossible in a 15 or 20 minute message to discuss all the approaches and ideas that are outlined in this book, which is written by Dr. Wayne Dyer. But this morning, I'll focus on three issues, or three areas. One, how he got around to expressing a new perspective on the subject around which the publication is based. Two, I'd like to identify and align with the principles of truth which we practice here. And three, give some focus to any one aspect that we could utilize as a principle-centered idea. In this publication, Dr. Dyer has sought to present a new perspective to the idea of intention. A new idea which he himself had arrived at as he had journeyed along his own pathway of evolution to a higher consciousness. This had resulted in his experiencing a, an, an increasing awareness 
of his contact with spirit and had meant for him significant improvement in the overall quality of his life. Dr. Dyer at the outset was at pains to explain that like his fellow academics in the fields of psychology, sociology, and the personal growth theories, he was clear that intention was driven and demonstrated by a purposeful approach. Demonstrated by consistent determination and consistent resolve to achieve a specific result and an attitude of holding an internally driven vision which propels one towards achievement. But gradually, Dr. Dyer found out, as he spoke about in this book, as he evolved to a greater recognition of his spirituality, he was beginning to perceive a connection between intent and a heightened awareness of his connection as a human being enjoying a spiritual experience. At this stage, he also began to realize that his new understanding of intent was in fact pretty opposite to his earlier ideals of individual will, determined ego, focus, and drive. He was perceiving that intent was not something that you did, but was in fact a force existing in the universe as an invisible field of energy. So what is intention from Dr. Dyer's perspective? His ideas were confirmed by information contained in a book written by Carlos Castaneda. And Castaneda said intent was a force that exists in the universe and is a field of energy that flows invisibly between, beyond the reach of our normal, everyday, habitual patterns. And with that revelation, Dr. Dyer seeks us to focus on the priority of intention. He spoke about it constantly. He immersed himself in the new ideas that had been revealed to him. He created a space for immense dialogue through telephone contacts, through letters, through articles, through group discussions, all of which culminated in this signal publication the power of intention, learning to co-create the world your way. So where is intention? Dr. Dara followed the work of some very prominent researchers who believe that our intelligence, our creativity, and our imagination interact with the energy field of intention rather than being thoughts or elements in our brain. So when Dr. Dyer was asked, where is this energy field? The response was, there is no place that it is not. There is no place that it is not. He continued by asserting that it was true for all life forms. A rose bush, a mosquito, an acorn, an apple blossom, they all had intent built into their creation. The acorn, when cut open, does not show an oak tree, but that is its intent. And it didn't become a pumpkin. The apple blossom in springtime appears as a flower, but next summer it becomes an apple, not an orange. Nature simply progresses from its field of intention. Human beings, as far as Dr. Dyer is concerned, are similarly intended and demonstrate the principle of what scientists have called the future pull in the DNA, which is present at conception and progresses to fruition based on physical and other characteristics set in motion at conception. So imagine a force everywhere, indivisible, present in anything that you see or touch, and extend this awareness beyond any idea of form or boundaries. So it is represented in both physical 
and non-physical forms. It therefore means that we have access to infinite potential which we can utilize for activating our desires both in the physical and non-physical plane. At this point in discussing his new perspective on intention, Dr. Dell makes a truly profound statement. He says, if there is an omnipresent power of intention that's not only within me, but in everything and everyone, then we're connected by this all-pervading source to everything and everyone and to what we'd like to be, what we'd like to have, what we want to achieve, and to everything in the universe that will assist us. Now, is not that statement one of our connection to the one source in the, in, of which we are truly inseparable? Is not that what we speak to every day at the temple? So, Dr. Da, in his new perspective, about the whole issue of intent and intention has come around to a statement that supports the very center of our principle and our practice of truth. That we're connected by this all-pervading source to everything and everyone and to what we'd like to be, what we'd like to have, what we'd like to achieve, and to everything in the universe that will assist us. So Dr. Daya proceeds logically then, having spoken about the whole issue of unification and our connection to this source, he proceeds to say, if we are connected by this all-pervading source to everything and everyone, what are then the issues that necessitate or need at various times in our existence to seek realignment? And he sought to point out six such circumstances, and I will list them here. First, the idea of I am what I have. My possessions define me. The second one, I am what I do. My achievements define me. The third, I am what others think of me. My reputation defines me. Number four, I am separate from everyone. My body defines me. And the fifth, I am separate from all that is missing in my life. My life space is disconnected from my desires. And the sixth one, I am separate from God. My life depends on God's assessment of my worth. Six circumstances that would necessitate our consistently work to align and realign ourselves with source. If you look at the six circumstances, you probably say casually, I know that, it's the signs of mind 101. It doesn't apply to me. But interestingly enough, Sometimes we make decisions. Our decisions, in fact, speak to an unalignment. I know number two and three apply to me. I really have to work hard at this thing called work and life balance. My friends and family call me a workaholic. I think subtly I have to work at the fact about my reputation around work. And so far, I know that there are so many seductive ways. Sometimes you make decisions, and they're quite arbitrary. And afterwards, you say, you know, that decision, which supports my reputation and professionalism, was not the best for me as a child of God seeking to stay centered and aligned. It might have been good for my reputation, but wasn't necessarily the best thing in terms of the principles that I'm working on. So let's not negate the idea that these are obviously the things that we 
are taught not to work at, that they're, that they're not there and they don't meet us in life and seduce us in several ways. In speaking of these six circumstances, Dr. Dyer spoke about the impossibility of accessing our connection with source and accessing the power of intention through ego. And he didn't really go into any detail about the issue of ego. I have had an idea. Those who are wiser than me can correct me. That there is a refined ego and an unrefined ego. I've always felt that the refined ego understands the I am. The refined ego understands I am, the power of I am, the centering of I am, the connection when you understand the I am that I am. But the unrefined ego speaks about I am. I am this authority. I am this power. I have this, I do this. You come to me. That is the unrefined ego. And I suspect that that is the unrefined ego that Dr. Dyer speaks about, separating us from our alignment with source and with center. And then he speaks about four steps to ensure we stay aligned with source. First step, he said, and it's four stages, and they're sequential. The first one is discipline. He said you cannot achieve new boundaries without practice, without exercise, without non-toxic habits. And of course, the best place to practice is life, right? You can't hide away. You have to practice and you have to put yourselves out there and move yourselves past your comfort boundaries in this thing called life. And that's really when you test what you know and to what degree you know what you know. The second step he speaks about is wisdom. He says wisdom, when combined with discipline, allows us to be more focused, more patient, more harmonizing mentally, more harmonizing emotionally and physically. And the third step, he speaks about love. He says, mastery truly involves loving what you do and doing what you love. And the fourth step is surrender. Surrender and letting go, which involves so many powerful aspects of our life. It involves love, it involves trust, it involves openness, it involves authenticity. We can't surrender and let go without experiencing in its truest sense all of these factors. But let me go back to love because I said one of the objectives this morning of sharing the ideas was to focus on some aspect that we could have as a principle centered idea. So I'm going to spend a little, few moments on love. And this love thing, not easy, you know. This love thing, not simple. This love thing about unconditional being. And I went to a service yesterday in St. Anne, celebrating the life of a father, of a colleague of mine. One of the speakers, in speaking about this person who has made the transition, spoke about his love and said that his life reminded him of a statement that he had learned in seminary. It says, see the king in a man and the king will rise up. See the queen in a woman and the queen will rise up. See the prince in a boy and the prince will rise up. And see the princess in a girl and the princess will rise up. So whatever we are seeing is what we're going to receive. 
and experience. And you and I know that seeing the king, the queen, the prince, and the princess, and all people around us, is not a simple matter. It takes work. It takes work to subtly understand that sometimes we are seeing things and we are judging as we are seeing them. We are hearing words and we are casting judgment as we hear them. Sometimes we go into situations where we are carrying the same filter and we are filtering the information in the same way we have kept filtering them before. And Dr. Dyer is saying, if you're really serious about this love thing, you have to get yourself out of the way every single time. You have to love what you hear without judgment. You have to love what you're seeing without judgment. You have to speak lovingly without judgment and you have to listen without judgment. You, we have opinions. We can have opinions after we have heard and seen. But judgment allows us to only see what we are judging at as we are seeing. To only hear what we are hearing as we are hearing. And so if there is one of the four steps that he speaks of, love is the one that I always feel that is the one to master to get everything else right. What I've spoken to you about this morning is chapter one. And the book has 12 chapters. So you understand the depth of this publication. It's a wonderful working manual. And the other chapters speak to a range of activity putting your intention to work, the connection with intention, and their various life steps and manuals, manual information that allows you. I really recommend this book. But before I end this morning, I want to share with you, at the end of chapter one, he speaks about five suggestions for implementing the ideas that we spoke about earlier on. Number one, so whenever you feel out of sorts, lost, or even in a mood, visualize a trolley strap hanging down from the field of intention, three or four feet above your head and grab it. I'll, I'll, I'll speak to this very quickly because he mentioned the whole idea of the trolley. He said when he was two or three years old in Detroit and traveling on the you know, trolley, tram cars, traveling on the, on, the, on the trolley with his mother, he always wondered why he couldn't hold on to the strap. All the adults around him were holding on to the strap. And he visualized himself, lifting himself up, and holding those straps. And when he was having cardiothoracic, cardiothoracic surgery, before he went into surgery, he imagined himself lifting up and holding those, those, those straps. And throughout his life, he says, anytime he has anxieties around anything, he remembers the idea and he visualizes this trolley and this strap and he lifts himself up and holds on to this strap. So he said, when you're down, find a strap that works for you and in your mind hold on to it. So state the word intent or intention repeatedly when you're in a state of anxiety or whatever, anything around you seems to keep you from your mission. Number three, Tell yourself that you have a life mission and a silent partner who is accessible at any moment you choose. Number four, we know this one well, right? Act as if anything you desire, you already have it. We know that, eh? Number five, he says that there's a Hasidic saying that he copies, that he has copied and carried with him everywhere he goes, and he recommends this. And the saying says, when you walk across the fields with your mind pure and holy, then from all the stones and all growing things and all animals, the sparks of their soul come out and cling to you. And then they are purified and become a holy fire 
in you. Those are five suggestions. For me, I would like to continue doing the work in this book because the power of intention is clearly a power to harness, to use, to work with, and to help us as we continue the alignment process to center as we practice the principles of truth. I believe whether you choose to read this book or utilize this book, that the idea that Dr. Dare has shared with us about the power of intention has been really important for me. And I recommend that we understand and spend more time thinking about what is intent, what's the power of intention, and how we use this to align ourselves, to understand that we're one with that one source, infinite potential, always at our disposal, to call on and to center us as we go forward in this world. So happy intenting. You, you are intent. You were intent at conception. And continue to enjoy this week. And have a blessed day and week. Thank you.